Okay, everybody, this is the first lecture for day two on our 16-hour marathon stretch. And uh, this one is probably the most important lecture I'm going to give you all weekend. It's the one on the basic concepts. Puts the big picture together in terms of what you're doing. We found out about activities. It's only one small piece of the puzzle. We have different things that we can build. So I'm going to go through the different types of uh, different... Oops, what's wrong? Different types of... Uh, here we go. Different types of uh, components that exist and how they work together and how they work apart and how we design these things. Uh, so understanding applications and their components and the concepts. We covered activities yesterday. We're also going to cover services today. Uh, broadcast receivers, mm, we might actually get there today with an email program, uh, probably not till after lunch. Uh, content providers, we're going to get there probably before lunch. Intents. We covered intents, believe it or not. And Android Manifest. Well, we covered the manifest, not completely. I'm sorry? Is it Manifest XML? Yep, and the manifest, as I'm reminded, is an XML file. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, it is an XML file, but it is a component. It's a feature of the environment. So it's more than just a simple XML file. It's not optional either. The manifest, uh, I'll get to it in a few minutes, but the manifest... Um, is the controlling kind of controlling engine of the entire application. So you mess up your manifest, and you've messed up the application. And the application is written in Java. We know that it's possible to write native Java code. We'll not cover that in this course, actually. What do I mean by native Java code? In the old days, before Eclipse came around, just as a special note to mention, we wrote everything in Java and compiled it with Java JVM. I mean, then we converted it to the correct DEX format that we needed. And we didn't use Eclipse. In fact, you don't have to use Eclipse. You can write it all from a notepad if you want to. Eclipse is nothing more than an automator. And unfortunately, it's a good and a bad thing. The automation is good when you don't know the components or the pieces. The automation is bad, as we found out yesterday, when we don't want to use a menu. And we have a menu file. And our manifest, or actually, yeah, it was the manifest. I got messed up because of that. So um, you have to kind of take the, take the automation with a grain of salt. So. Good separation corresponding security from other applications. So the manifest actually, believe it or not, is holding all of our security privileges, all of the rights, responsibilities of the app. It's also identifying which activities, services, broadcast receivers, content providers, what can be done by the app. So each application that's running, as I mentioned yesterday, is in a separate world of its own. It's running on its own process. It only sparks one process, so it's one process per app, which is why we saw in Hello World that intent that switches one activity to another activity. Well, we can have an activity that actually switches to a, a background process, a service, and then the app is still running. So, And then we can tell from the service all of the life cycle stages, as I mentioned yesterday, when it's on resume, when it's on pause, and we can play around with that as a service and see what's going on to minimize resources, but also to add functionality to the app. So I'll talk about that a little bit more today as well. Each process has its own separate VM. The VMs aren't shared. They're shared in the Java environment on your computer, but they're not shared on an Android phone, which is kind of funny. That's why I say each app is on an island of its own, working in its own environment. So if it creates a database, it's only for that app. It doesn't work with any other apps out there. So that database concept is slightly different. We'll see that. Because we don't have uh, shared data among different apps, nothing is shared. Um, each application is assigned a unique Linux user ID. Well, think of it like a process ID by default files. And the applications are only visible to that application. So all of the applications are only visible to whatever belongs to the same ID can be explicitly exported. Yes, <coughs> actually, it is explicitly exported. So application components, activities, this is what we saw. This is what we saw yesterday. Visual user interfaces focusing on single things a user can do. Services, no visual interface. Uh, they run in the background. How are you going to get a service to start? Well, you could just make an app as a service and then have the service start when the phone boots up. Kind of like a service you get in a Unix, envi Unix environment, like a script. Um, you could have an activity, use an intent, start a service, and then the activity closes, and then the thing runs. It's just, the user at some point in time doesn't even know that the app is even running. 
it's on the phone. Usually you want some sort of way of getting back to the server service, excuse me, so that the app can stop. Otherwise you end up with security issues. So there's violations of security policies that exist when services stay longer than they're supposed to or when they're started by apps and then they're not finished or there's activity that's monitored. The VM, or the JV, uh, DVM, is keeping track of these services and organizing them just like an operating system. So go back to Operating Systems 101. Think about how processes are managed by process control block and how the kernel is actually scheduling these processes. The same thing happens, it's a baby computer. It's a Unix box, scheduled the same way. And so the manifest file is the one that's setting all of the information up for the process control block or for the service block. Why don't we want services? Well, what if we have a chat program and we're waiting for a chat to come in? <laughs> we can set up, well, we'll probably use a broadcast receiver for that, but we can set up a service that runs in the background that automatically opens up our app and doesn't open up the default app, as an example, when a new text comes in. So a text message comes in, the service is in the background listening, waiting for a new text to come in. Text comes in, it opens up your app for the text messaging, and your app is basically running that way. So how are you going to do that? Well, you need a service. So you need to start up your app, click, wait for something. Did you have a question back there? Yeah, so, so activity is a broadcasting? Activity? Yeah. Activities are what we worked with yesterday. No, no, I mean, oh. uh, so broadcast receivers and senders are different concepts. I'm going to get to that today, actually. Activity is a totally, all of these things are entirely separate, unique, standalone components that can work with each other, but they're definitely their own, their own component in their own right. There no, there's no similarities among any of them. We take the functionality from a programming perspective, we break it out into these four components, and we build, the compo we build our apps with these components. So activity doesn't necessarily need to run with a service. Services don't need to run with broadcast receivers either. A service is nothing more than an activity that runs in the background. <laughs> Think of a service on a Windows computer. That's a service as a service as a service. It's the same concept. Broadcast receivers are a bit different. The broadcast receivers send and react to broadcast announcements. So on the top of your phone, you usually have notifications that are up there. That's a broadcast receiver functionality. Notifications. Incoming text that send broadcast receivers through the service. So the service would pick up the text message coming in, send a broadcast receive, broadcast sender, send a broadcast to your app to wake it up and say, hey, you got a text message coming in. Then the the receiver would pick it up and open up your app from turn it from a service into an activity by using an intent probably to take it from a service, stop the service, we don't need it anymore, or we could pause the service, leave it there, we go back to it eventually, open up the main activity of the program, run the populate the text field with the body of the received text, and then proceed forward with the next activity that's going to go on. So it's activity to an intent to service to broadcast receiver. So we're putting all these components together and programming them all separately, actually. Mostly making instances of these objects. We're also going to see today, in probably our first or second tutorial we're going to go through in a few minutes, is the content providers. we got a lot of content on that phone. Why should your app keep its separate address book? It doesn't need to. It can use the address book on the phone. So we have different ways of sharing information, as I mentioned before, through the content providers. So here's what we can do. We can't share information in a database. We can't share information in text files. We can share information through web services, through a web or through a cloud. We have cloud services. Or we can share through content providers. Content providers serve up address book information, textbook information, you know, text message information, files, anything that's stored by the phone itself is made available for data exchange between applications. And you can create your own content provider. Call it My Data <laughs> or something. So you create your own content, you put it on the phone, and then you can have multiple apps actually kind of get at the same content. How do you think the address book actually works? Or the telephone dialer and some of the other features on the phone work through the concept of the content provider? So you can take, make, and create your own content provider instance, get it content on the phone, add your own content to the phone, and uh, 
essentially customize your working environment. Yes? Content is not a database. It's two separate concepts. We have SQL Lite on the phone that gives us database, database capabilities. Content providers are not stored in like an SQL table, cannot be queried like an SQL database, not really a database structure. It's um, a proprietary structure that is built to house data in a readable format through methods that you call to add an item, to receive an item. Hold that question until we see our first uh, content provider example, which is going to come before lunch. And then that, then you'll see the light bulb will come on with that one, I think. We make a new instance of the content provider that we're interested in. And then we call methods on the content provider. Not run like a database, though. Database, actually, believe it or not, if you have any database background, it's like, da it's like SQL is SQL. The database is data. So you can create a database table. In the and we have I have an example I'll show you with this create a database table load some information in the table retrieve information out of the table I don't know if we're going to hit databases this weekend though I think it's going to be the following weekend because it's too much to cover with some of the other stuff going on but uh, yes can you provide JSON Jason's different Jason as mentioned in the front row over here. <laughs> can be used on Android phones, can be used on iPhones, it can be used anywhere. It's when you want to send data back and forth between your device and another remote location. When I say databases in here, I mean inside of the app you have a database and you're using the phone to house the database. It's not housed on a remote server. JSON's a very popular utility that's used same way on the iOS device actually to send and receive data. Or multi, not database, it's really just sending information off to another server, receiving the information from the server, and it manages the communication channel between your device and the server. It's like a filter kind of thing. Activities. These are basic components of most applications. Most applications have several different activities that start each other as needed. We saw that already. So each is implemented as a subclass of the base activity class. So we see uh, class, main activity, extends activity. We're inheriting from activity. So we can inherit from other things. So activity, the view. Each activity has a default window, as we saw. This is a little bit of review from yesterday. To draw, although it may be prompted for dialogues or notifications or other things, it doesn't have to be tied to the window. The content of the window is a view or a view group, so or mo multiple views derived from view or view group. We're going to see these today in the views. Um, in fact, uh, the views are kind of, and the view groups are kind of an interesting concept. It's uh, very similar to other uh, like sub views, but it's called a view group. So other app, other mobile application and platforms call have different wording for it, but it's the same concept. Taking a view, sticking it inside of another view, inside of another view. Nesting views, it's a hierarchical relationship among the views. The views are giving us the window. Actually, it's giving us the interface. The, the views are inside of the window. The window is tied to the activity. So each one as example of the view components. We have buttons, text fields. We saw this yesterday. Uh, menu items, check boxes. And then we have the view group that's made visible via the activity.setContext view. So this line of code that we keep seeing over and over again in the onCreate method is setting the context view to the view that we've identified. And the view that we've identified is stored in the XML file. So it's activity underscore main.xml or main.xml, whatever you want to call it. You don't have to call it anything. And that's one of the beauties of uh, actually working in this environment. You don't have to call it anything. Oh, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> there's, no, there's no naming standard that's fixed for it. Services does not have a visual interface. We can put a service inside of an activity-based application. The activity stops, sends an intent, starts a service. So we can have multiple items in there. Runs in the background indefinitely. It's a daemon process. It doesn't normally have any way of stopping. You can stop the service, however. If you're looking at the life cycle of the app, and that app has a life cycle to it. The service also works with that life cycle. So you can on a pause, on a resume, on a destroy. You can clean things up. 
You can unload, load different components. You can make the service actually work like an activity. It just doesn't have a user interface. In fact, it is an activity. It just doesn't have a UI. No view. Examples might be network downloads, uh, playing music. That's a good one. A TCP or UDP server connection. So this, this is a Unix box, so you can send and receive messages the old way or the manual way. Can also be it can be can, you can bind to an existing service and control its operation through another service. As an example, if I had a going back to that text messaging app I was talking about, I could have my service that works with the regular service that's on the phone that receives the text messages and then have this service. When that service does something, my service is going to pick it up and do it for that other service. So the services actually can work together, can talk to each other. Services can also work with activities. There's no restriction on that. Broadcast receivers. Oh, okay. So receive and react to broadcast announcements. What's a broadcast announcement? Hey, I got a call. Call's coming in. Okay, um, what do I want me to do? Receive it. Okay, I'm going to receive it. I'm going to do something with it. So extend the class for the broadcast receiver. Examples of broadcast receivers. We can do it for uh, low battery. Ooh, okay. Power connected. Shut down. Time zone change. That's a good one for today. Probably needed that one. Other applications. <laughs> so you can also initiate broadcast receivers. You can have your own. You can make up your own. Phone get dropped. or Actually, a nice little one might be looking at the motion of the phone. I've seen an app out there. It's actually kind of cool. You can probably write it yourself very easily. You receive the gyro on the phone. You put the phone in the pocket. You take a walk, and it'll be a step counter. Because <laughs> you're measuring for each one of the changes. You're getting a broadcast receiver message for each one of the changes. And you're counting them up. One two, three, one, and how many steps you've made, which is basically how step counters work, that they sell it to you in a little plastic thing and you put it on your belt and you walk around with it. And it's really popular. It was popular for a while for Android apps, you know, build your own step counter. Yeah? So the push may come into the broadcast uh, category? The push? The push may operate on a mobile device. Like, yeah. Know, so that operates on the same yep. concept? Actually, all of the built-in features of the phone operate on the same concepts. And they all work together, actually. So you can, you can actually replace components. You can, re, you can receive components from things the user is doing with the phone. Unlocking it, locking it, uh, pushing. Any, anything, actually, um, can be received and interpreted. Basically, what you're doing is you're putting a listener on there. And it, the receiver acts like a listener and listens for what's going on. And on the phone, actually, go, let's go back to the battery for a second because that's easier to conceptualize sometimes. The battery is going to send up a signal. And the receiver is just going to be a signal receiver in this particular case. In fact, it's all signal driven to begin with. There's a si signal table that's being kept with so all of the activity. In the background is being pushed to the interface. Correct. That's it. it's, all, it's just a push to the interface. But in order to push it to the interface, you have to have something up there to receive it. It's kind of like how you check for signals, signal handlers. It's a, it's a low-based signal handler, if you know about operating systems. CD-ROM drives open, sends a signal up. Hey, the door is open. If you don't catch it, you're not going to be able to do with it. Signals happen all the time. And at any one moment of time, your battery might be low. You might have lost your signal. Your Wi-Fi might have stopped or something. You can receive all that stuff. If you receive it, you're just building in a signal handler, essentially. You don't have to use any of that terminology or even know about that concept, but that's what it is, in, in essence. So. so how do you trigger the uh, broadcast, broadcast messages? Then, how do you trigger? Well, that's different. Broadcasting is different than receiving. Um, to receive, you create a receiver, broadcast receiver, and say, listen for battery indicator. <laughs> There's a built-in set of methods for the receiver. So you create a new instance of the receiver object and say, receiver, wait, tell me when the battery's low. <laughs> and when it happens, it's going to trigger the method. The method's going to go, hey, battery's low, put a little toast message out. Say, hey, your battery's low. Or, hey, uh, it's been an hour since you turned me on. 
or I've been running for three days straight. You can test you know, how long the phone's been running, how much battery you've got, how much memory you have on the SD card, all that stuff. You run the method that's associated with the receiver for the component that you're trying to receive a message from to interpret the message that's going to be sent up, and the sent up is going to be like a form of a signal. So You can do the opposite, is what you were saying. To broadcast out, sen broadcast senders would say, um, when my app has been up for an hour and I have a message on my calendar that says a reminder, actually a reminder program would be a good broadcast sender, put a little notification up there that I have a meeting at 1 o'clock and then your app at 1 o'clock would broadcast a message to the notification out there and say, you pull it out, hey, meeting at 1 o'clock. So your app told the phone something, broadcasted it out the other direction. Instead of receiving it, it sent it out. That's good because especially when you write your own text message program, the receiver receives a text coming in. Well, the broadcast announcement is not going to show up from the default application. It's going to show up from your application if you have to write one that says, you know, hey, I got a new text message <laughs> or a new email or a new telephone call or something. And if you're replacing it, you can easily replace the functionality and make your phone work how you want it to work. So, A lot of trouble though to reinvent the wheel. Most people just use built-in apps that are there. Content providers, going back to this concept, make some of the application data available to other applications, shares application data, be shares data between different applications. It's the only way to transfer data between applications on the Android. There's no shared files, no shared memory, no pipes. Nothing is shared between any of those processes. That's the only thing you really have to keep in mind, and it, it's a, not a limitation. It's a design feature for security. It's just like how Java applets can't read and write to files, <laughs> Java programs. Well, on a PC, they can share, but you have registers and you have, you have policy, security policy files and things that keep track of what app can do what. In the Android environment, you have the same thing. It's the manifest, however, that's opening up the Internet. It's the manifest that's opening up reading and writing to files, and we're going to see manifest permissions actually today, and then we'll see, well, that, that's what's going on, and it's for the single app. So the single app is a single process, single JVM, brand new JVM. It doesn't share anything with anything else. Nothing gets shared on this phone. So, But we have techniques to share data. Broadcast receivers, senders, content providers actually is a good one for that. Extends the class mm -hmm. content provider. On, send the class for the content provider, you make a new object out of it, and then you do run a method to get the contacts or set the contacts or something. Other applications use a content resolver object to access the data provided via the content provider. And as I mentioned, you can create your own content providers. You can add your own, supplement your own concept in there. Most of the communication between the apps, or excuse me, within the app, between activity versus broadcast, versus loading another activity, another service, content provider, you'll use an intent. And so we saw this on the first app because we're going to use this over and over and over again. <laughs> Intents are a way you stop one activity, start another. So an intent is an intent object with a message content in it. That's the bundle. That's the put extras, get extras out of that bundle. The bundle's storing the information we're sending between the intents, and I called it a pipe. It is actually sort of a Unix pipe kind of concept. It's the communication channel between one application and another. And if you're not familiar with Unix pipes, I realized that a couple of people weren't yesterday. If I was running like an LS, and I'm going to pipe that to something else that's going to do a concatenation, like in a Unix environment, we can string some commands together, send the output of this one to the input of that one, and we can have things flow um, in like one script. You can have like five different commands all working with each other simultaneously. That's what I'm calling this intent. <laughs> it's a way of it's a way of calling another program or excuse me another activity, another part of the app, and sending it some information, receiving some information back, doing all sorts of stuff with it actually. So the intent can be automatically updated. The intent gets created, and then you add stuff. 
you put extras into the intent and you send the extras and that becomes what I'm referring to as a bundle. It's not an OS bundle in that concept, but it's a, a grouping of data and the key value um, relationship. So we can say name is this to address is that. When we send the intent, we can so send this bundle. Nope, just the receiver of the intent. If I have this activity that makes an intent to load this activity, this one's sending it to this one. It's not sending it to the entire world. It's not sending it outside of the app. It's just not even anything else inside of the app. It's only sending it to the intent. <coughs> That's why I call it a pipe, because this, this app is connected to this app now, but this by this relationship of this connection of this intent that's writing in between them. And so it can send information. And the purpose of that is essentially switch from one component to another component, switch and then retain information between the components and the activities. Yeah. Can you, can you have multiple connections? Oh, of course. You can. In fact, I've seen really nice menuing applications done this way. Like you have a main activity, and the activity involves is like quizzes and videos and bulletin board and chat and all these other options on it, right? And you just click and it just load an intent, <laughs> intent object, load this screen. Intent object, load that screen. Intent object. It's uh, very similar if you're familiar with Xcode and uh, iOS. It's like the storyboard where you're pushing one UI to another UI to another UI to another UI. And which one's loaded? Well, whichever one you push to. <laughs> and you push, instead of uh, connecting them and wiring them through, uh, now I have to think about, I'm not going to think about iOS right now. That'll get me confused. Instead of wiring them like you do with an iOS, you're running an intent. There's more programming with that. Actually, there's more programming with the Android than there is with the iPhone when it comes to the UI navigation. And we don't have as many navigation controllers either, but we're getting better. The Android uh, definitely has grown over the years, and we've got similar features to the point where it's almost like 100% compatible. It's very, very close in terms of functionality. In the beginning, totally different platform. <laughs> I mean, even from a user, you can tell the differences as the as the platform has evolved. Okay, so the intent object is the message content, has the message content inside of it. Activity services, broadcast receivers are all started with intents. So content providers are started with content resolvers. Content providers is kind of different because we're not changing to the content, we're just resolving the location and we're getting the information from the content provider. So an activity started with a context.start activity intent, 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 whatever intent it is, or activity.start activity for result intent with a result code. It's like start an activity, are you going to switch the activity or are you going to start an activity and wait for the activity to end and then receive back whatever that activity does and use it in your activity, which is kind of a separate concept, but it works the same way. A service is started with a content start service, intent service. So the intent's used to start the service, and the service then runs in the background, and then you can switch back. So the service can run, and you can also have a foreground intent. As long as you're intenting the service from the activity, and the activity's running in the foreground, then the activity will remain in the foreground, but the service is started in the background. So think of it, a service as a background process. Your app is still running, whether or not you have a UI in front of you or not. <laughs> but the app is still running. Android phone, you're going to run multiple apps simultaneously. And they all play around. They don't, they don't communicate with each other. They're all on islands of their own. So an app can initiate a broadcast as well by using the intent. So in any of the content that's set broadcast intent intent. Also, the content can set the ordered broadcast. And the content can send a sticky broadcast meaning just put it up whenever, or put it up in a certain order. This message comes before this message, which comes before that message, and then we wait. Because when we have broadcast, it's kind of interesting. It has to share the memory of the phone and the activities of the phone. If the user is doing something else, the broadcast may not necessarily be broadcasted. <laughs> Depends on what's going on. And if you send five broadcasts out there, it's a U think of this sort of like UDP. So the context you mean is this current activity? Yes. Context is going to be, well, the context is what you're going to specify. When you set the context, it's the current activity, usually that you're going to be working with. And you can change the context to other activities 
by using by sending, and this is what this is doing essentially, is setting the intents to uh, send broadcast, um, start service. So context is set context. Context we get from uh, on create actually automatically. So uh, let's see. There was something else I was saying, but I can't remember what it was. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, like UDP. So if you send five messages out, if you're running a UDP format, I think this is like TCP UDP package sending. So you send, you send a ball across the street. Here, let me do it without using terminology, technical terminology. You got five balls, basketballs, and you got five people on one side of the street and five people on the other side of the street, and you throw the balls. How do you know what order they're going to show up in? <laughs> one ball is going to throw harder than another ball. One ball is going to get lost and not make it to the other side of the street. It's kind of like the unreliable data protocol where you got, your, your, it's unreliable. Broadcast receivers are unreliable because it's running in a UDP kind of fashion where we're just going to throw it out. We're not going to manage it. Because it's faster, easier, Less time consuming, uses fewer resources on the on the application on the phone itself. So, if you're thinking about it sort of like a UDP perspective of just throwing balls across the street, then you can pick the order. Like they must arrive in a particular order, or they're going to be sticky. They just sometimes they make it, sometimes they not. In fact, you probably have noticed this yourself with broadcast receivers. Phone comes in and like two hours later, hey look, I got a phone call. I had a missed message it doesn't show up immediately. Or it waits until the next missed message comes in because it got lost, and then it shows up. And you say, oh, and I got two missed calls. Wow, where did that come from? I never saw the missed. And then you always blame yourself. I never saw the first one. How did that happen? You know, sometimes it's the phone and the broadcast receiver. It's unreliable data. So it's just being, it's just thrown out of broadcast whether the phone picks it up. It might be busy. It might be doing something else. It might get stuck. It might get lost. So... Um, you can actually kind of tweak it a little bit, but you don't really have that much control over it. And even the phone itself makes mistakes. Shutting down components. Activities can terminate itself via finish. You run the finish method and it's done. So if you want to really conserve resources within the app that you're running and you're using an intent, we didn't actually run finish on our get name because you can press the escape key and actually go back to the previous view in that app that we created. If we put finish on the bottom of that button after the intent runs, then we can't. We press escape and no more. We can't get back to get name or name getter, whatever that was called. It's gone. The activity's gone completely, <laughs> which is going to essentially do nothing. We're stuck at the main screen. Um, so if you don't ever want to go back to it, then you finish it. You finish it, you conserve resources. It's unloaded now, and whatever you have loaded is going to be the current, and you can't go back can't navigate back that way. So sometimes for navigational reasons you want to end the activity. You don't want to let it pause in the background. So you can actually easily put those little messages in there on the on resume, on pause, which is what's in there actually in the log files that we looked at yesterday in that other, act, at other example that we built where you go from one screen to another screen. Well the first one's paused. You're not, only one screen is active at a time. The other one's paused. So and then it's resumed when you go back to it. So you can do things, you know, clear it out, actually. Clear out the text box when it gets resumed so that the previous text still isn't in there anymore. So for, it depends on the functionality you're trying to achieve in the app in terms of what, how you're going to design that. And you can terminate other activities that started via finish activity. So name getter could actually terminate the main activity because it called the main activity. Called it, and it can call it back. <laughs> finish it. Get rid of it. Uh, so if you had a menuing system that you had a main menuing kind of program and you had buttons that loaded up other activities, you can have those buttons. When you picked another button, terminate the previous one, load another one. Terminate the previous, load another one. So you can kind of organize your memory a little bit, um, not make it so that, you know, the more screens you load, the slower your app's going to run. So you can terminate stuff. Uh, services can uh, be terminated via a stop self within the service. So activities are generally uh, stopping themselves or activities that they have started. Services are stopping themselves because there's nothing. The nature of the service, there's nothing that's attached to it. 
It's out there on an island of its own. So you stop the service or context stops service from within the context if you can still get to it. Content providers are only active when responding to content resolvers. When there's no resolver anymore, there's no provider, <laughs> it's gone. You don't have to worry about stopping that. You can just leave it open. Broadcast receivers are only active when receiving, uh, responding to broadcasts. So they go away when there's no more broadcasts. Uh, so let's take a look at the Android manifest. We looked at this kind of from a cut and paste perspective, but we really didn't actually look at it yesterday. Its main purpose is in the life, uh, main purpose in life is to declare the components of the system and provide privileges. Add that to this as well. So this is what we did when we changed, uh, what's this, frenetic activity? <laughs> we changed the uh, main activity to something else because we set the, end, the, ac the main application activity. Well, if we only have one activity in here and when we load it up, we're only going to get one activity. So the main activity is going to be the first activity listed here on application. It's going to be the name of the activity as a from programming perspective along with the path. And then we're going to have the icon for the, uh, for the app itself and then the label. And we're going to call it by a string. We're going to look at strings. This is coming from the string subdirectory but it's not really a subdirectory in this case this is string.xml this is a directory drawable and this is the file that's inside of the directory so we have opening and closing tags we have application opening application closing activity opening activity closing so if we want to run multiple we run multi we put multiple activities in the manifest if we don't put it in the manifest it won't run we're going to get one of those Nothing, actually nothing's going to happen in that particular case. We also put intent filters in the manifest. So we declare the intent handler by the current application in the manifest. So here it is here, it says intent filter. So it shows in the launcher and is in the main ap application to start. And then uh, this particular manifest I believe is holding uh, uh, two different applications here. We've got uh, application name main and one that says bounce and then we have action and category uh, where do we see action in here action is a uh, which which action which screen uh, view main launcher is going to be the category well the category is going to be it's it, I'm going to get to that actually when I show you another intent example, so hold that thought actually, because you have to see it in action to, to you have to well, see it in motion to, to catch what the action is going to be. It's what kind of behavior are you going to do? Are you going to replace it? You're going to put it down below. You can actually have intents that fill up the same area and run in different category names. So you, the category name is actually just a, an identification so that you can go back to it or change it. Uh, we'll see that when we see another intent example. The concept to get out of here is the fact that we have to register it with the manifest. So we have the intent filter that we're going to put in here along with the two screens, the two activities. Here we just have one activity with two intent filters. So we're not running multiple activities. Um, and the intent filters are going to load, one's going to load a bounce screen activity, the other one's going to load the main activity. And uh, here we're just using a default for the category. Here we're going to use a launcher as a category, which means we launched it. It's in a category. We can take that category, put another thing in that category. Instead of this particular screen, we can put another screen in there, another view, another activity. So. All right. So that was the basic concept, and that was lecture number three. So... I want to run this. I'm going to skip ahead to content providers because this is a really good breaking point for content providers to sort of see how that works and then get our feet wet because this tutorial is not too bad, actually. You all have, I hope at this point, working Android systems, working Android tools. So let's go ahead and jump into this. And then we'll take a break after this one and figure out. I'm going to plan the breaks around the ends of the tutorials <laughs> so I can go around and help people. So if you're having problems during the tutorial, if you hold off until we're done, it'll make the tutorial go faster and less, less painful for some people. <laughs> then I'll go around and troubleshoot all of your problems 
and maybe you'll be able to figure them out by the time I'm done with the tutorial. So, uh, so this one's called a contact pick contact picker, and this contact picker is located just in case you have forgotten. Although I've drilled this in many times already, it is in the tutorial section right here. So in the tutorial section, it is this one right here. Contact uh, contact tutorial and contact solution. We're going to look at content providers on the phone, look at something a little bit different than the activity. So it's a fairly straightforward one. What's it going to do? It's going to send an email message out to a contact. So if I take, and let's just take a look at the finished product actually. Uh, I'm going to load the finished product to show you what we're building, and then we're going to build it and see how close we can get to it. You can tweak it and do different things to it. To build it, it does rely upon there being contacts on, in your device. If you actually have a device, and also a registration of a, a default email program to send an email. So if you have a device, this one's an interesting one to actually see working on your device. So it's contact, contact picker, if I can say it right. <laughs> and uh, let's go and uh, I'm going to load my VirtualBox emulator. And get my system set up to go here. So one of the first things I'm going to do, especially if you just install VirtualBox, you want to know what pattern to use when you're doing this. I always open up Eclipse first, and then I open up VirtualBox second, and then I'll run the script third, and then I'll just leave it alone until I'm done. Because if you open up Eclipse second VirtualBox first, sometimes it has problems making the connection. But if Eclipse is already open, the connection is it's already established. It's going to look for something loaded after. So, and it's the ADB that we're connecting. So, so if you've got VirtualBox opened up, you see. In fact, okay. So here's the the next step is to load that script. And uh, first time I load the script, it says it has to load the daemon, which wasn't running. That's the ADB manager. So it loaded the ADB manager, and now it says I'm connected to uh, localhost 5555. And then I can close that terminal window. I don't need it open. So now I have VirtualBox connected to, uh, to, to Eclipse, and I'm all ready to go. So on my uh, VirtualBox, you don't have to do this if you're using the Android emulators. If you're using the built-in Android emulators, wait till you actually run the finished product. Uh, but if you're on a VirtualBox system, which most of you are actually, if you come in here, you'll see this icon that says Contacts. Click on Contacts. I put some contacts in here, actually. You're going to want to make sure you have some contacts in your contact. So that when your contact provider goes and goes <laughs> looks for it, it doesn't come back with empty. Because <laughs> we want to load contacts. So what we're going to do is write an app that uses a content provider that goes to our contact address book. What are contacts? Well, on my book, on my phone, a real phone, I have like, I don't know how many contacts I have, but, you know, people that want to save the telephone number, email address. So you can actually, if you don't have any on your emulator, which you're not going to have, you can use the menu button. So if you have my, my virtual box image, you click on this and you click on menu. And on the bottom it says new contact. So you click on new contact and you give it a name, uh, today's contact. To today, today's contact. Contact. And then uh, a family, I don't know, something, something. Phone number, uh, home, that's a good number to me. Email uh, someone at somewhere.com and uh, postal address. I'm going to leave it all alone. I'm just going to press on done, saving contact, and I have today's contact in here. So my screen is a bit bigger because my fonts are set huge <laughs> for visual display purposes, for demonstration purposes. Yours is going to look a little smaller, but the, these are your contacts. You put a picture in there if you want. 
If you've installed the emulator, this will stay. If you're running the ISO file and it's live, live disk, these contacts are going to go away. So don't add too many contacts to this. So my contacts are staying because I've installed the ISO. So that's another reason why you sometimes want to install the ISO so you can save data in the contacts list. Without any data in the contacts list, it's really hard to kind of see, um, to see what's going on with that. So I've actually already installed as well my contacts program. Um, I believe it should be in here. Uh, hmm, if it's not, I can just run it from the, uh, here it is, contacts picker. So this is the app that I tested with. I have a text box. I'm going to put some hint in there. Um, I mean, I'm going to put a name in here. Um, some, what did I call that person? Someone, someplace. Oh, today something. Two days. Well, let's see what happens here. So I'm going to pick an email. Actually, let's just pick the email. <laughs> Today's contact uh, something. So what this is doing, that button is going and loading up a new content provider, which is going to go load up my contact so I can pick somebody in here. This is a name with an email address, which is what I'm going to need. And then uh, upon picking the email address, actually, I can search in here. There we go. This one here. Upon selection, it goes back. No email found for contact. OK, great. What it's supposed to do, this is a not, I don't have a working email program on this emulator. What this is supposed to do is pick up the email address and open up a new mail message and put the email address in there so you can send that person an email message. So it's running and then it, it'll actually, I have a send mail program that gives you that functionality. This one is only a demonstration of how to actually access the content provider. So it's Bit, it's, a, it's a bit piecemealed. You have to actually work on it a little bit to actually complete the functionality on it. But what we're looking at is uh, if I press return on here, which is not working actually, um, the button is, appears to be working. It depends on which version I put up here actually as to what's going on. Uh, but it is supposed to pick it up. I may not have had an email put in. In fact, I don't think I put any emails in for everybody. I think I did put an email in for this one though. So this one, no email found or for contact, oh well. So let's see what's going on. Um, in fact, I can probably troubleshoot that problem. So this is the code for it. I've loaded it in, so I'm just going to close this one actually because I just ran it from the emulator. I don't need to use this one. And let's build this application so we can see how the content provider works. Now this is going to go over the content provider for the contacts. We have many other content services that we can actually use. This is just going to use content, contacts, which is very popular. So the tutorial here has to use, uh, it was introduced in API level 5, the content provider, contact, contacts, contacts class is inheriting from a class, base class that was introduced in API level 5. So we've added functionality to choose an existing content, send a canned message to that person. Um, make sure the device or the emulator has some contacts on it, obviously. Names and email addresses of contacts. So here we're going to start a new Android application. So and it's going to be a activity-based application. So go ahead and go through and start one. So file new. This should be old already. Other. And uh, it's going to be an Android application project. Click on Next. And I'm going to call this one Contacts, because I don't believe I have a Contacts in here. I don't. So then I'm going to go edu.i2. Or you can change and put whatever path you want on there. It could be com example. So you're going to put your email. You're going to put your, you know, when you get professional, you're going to put your web address backwards on there. So go ahead and press Next. Uh, for the API version, I have 8. You want to make sure you're above 5. That's what that warning was. So I'm using 8 as the lowest, which is the 2.2. 5 is 1 point something, so we don't want to use... You can't go back to a 1.5 emulator for this. It doesn't work. So uh, Next, 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 next. Blank main... Acti uh, new blank activity, next. Main activity. Okay, good, good, good. Finish. Just leave the defaults on everything. And now I have a new 
project over here called Contacts. First thing I like to do is build a GUI. So what are we going to have with the GUI? We're going to have a button, and we're going to have an input field with a hint on it. So instead of cutting and pasting, I'm actually just going to build it. It's not that complicated. So I'm going to drag, and then I'll change the names of the IDs over so it matches the code. Let me just take a look at the code real quick. It's using a relative layout, and we're going to have an edit text and a button on this relative layout. Okay, so instead of me cutting and pasting, I'm going to do it the proper way. This is cutting and pasting got me into trouble last time. I'm going to make this screen a little bit bigger here, and uh, so I can see it. I got this little thing here. I'm going to put this up here. I'm going to reuse this label, actually. The label ended up automatically because I picked the template of the blank, which is what I'm going to get. The name of the ac activity, contacts up here. This can be changed, however. we we'll change navigation. We're going to see this a little bit later today with different layouts. In fact, the next thing we're going to do is, after we get done with this one, load in some different layouts and take a look at them to see what's going on with them. But... Um, Okay, so I'm going to put in here a uh, edit text. So let's go put in some text fields here. And here's one that says ABC on it. It's pretty good here. It looks like an edit text. Plain text. Got put in here, edit text one. And then I'm going to put a button in here. So I'm going to go back to the form widget, select one of these buttons, and stick a button on here. I'd highly recommend playing around with the user interface. Add components to it. <coughs> That's the only way you're going to kind of figure out how to read. And what we're doing basically is now reading and writing to these components. So up here I'm going to put you know, enter. Whoops. That's not what I wanted. Whoops. Where'd my text go? Somebody's computer's making noise again. Well, you know what? I'm just going to remove that hello world thing. I don't know what I did with it. But, uh, so I'm going to switch back over to mainactivity.xml. I find it a little bit easier to edit in this, in this particular window. You can actually edit up here by clicking on the devices and using the properties down here. Um, you can use the properties to pretty much set everything you're doing in the XML. It depends on your preference as to what you want to do. So I'm going to flip it back to the XML though, because then I can see things a little bit easier. It appears that I got rid of the label, actually. <laughs> I have probably accidentally deleted it. Don't need the label anyway. For on the edit text, I'm going to add the hint, however, which is what was there before. So Android colon hint is going to be equal to. And I'm going to hard set the hint to something like an enter contact. So now I have the hint in there, and we're going to look at strings in the next project, and we'll see why that's really probably not the best way of doing it. Better to do it this way with a string. Um, not even using any strings in this one, actually. So, On the button here, I'm going to change the text on the button to search. Uh, to, you know, search contacts, or I mean, let me make it here. open contacts. How's that? Open contacts. Because it's really the functionality we're looking at in this particular project. Hopefully um, today you're not afraid to edit stuff now um, and you're able to uh, go through here and customize this, add whatever you want to your GUI, play around with it. Don't really have too many things you can possibly put on here, but uh, we'll see. Now uh, let me go back here and see what I'm supposed to make these IDs. <laughs> so I have a, mm, some hint I added in and then the ID is going to be invite email. So let's see what I have the ID in over here. Oh, this is for the text box. The ID here is edit text one. So I'm going to change this one because in the code I'm going to use it. In fact, at this point I can kind of remember what it is. If I change it, then I know what it is. But otherwise, I could use edit text one if I wanted to. But this one's going to be invite email for the edit text. So uh, I got my edit text in here. Uh, the layout left of this picker, well, it doesn't really matter. I don't really need to do anything outside of setting the IDs so that they match. Something I can remember at least. Uh, this one here is going to say pick email. And the ID here is going to be do email picker. So I'm going to go to the button here. I'm going to set the ID instead of button 1. Oftentimes I do see people just leave it. It says button 1, button 2, button 3. <laughs> and then you go, well, how do you know what button 1 is? 
And they go, ah, and they have the little notes. Button one is this, button two is this. So just do this. This is the name of the method that's going to be run when this button is clicked. It's going to be do email underscore picker. So I've said, uh, so what you need to do in here, if you want to copy and paste this, do it at your own risk. I'm not going to copy and paste it. Um, or you can copy and paste it out of the original project if you want. Two important things to do. Number one, change the labels. So you have uh, the button that says something like, instead of button one, it says uh, open contacts. And uh, the edit text, I put the hint, you don't really even need to do that. Uh, and then change the IDs. So the button matches do email picker. And the edit text ID matches invite email. Because we're going to read and write to these components inside of the activity, and so we need to be able to identify them. If you've done that, your interface is pretty much done for this application. There's nothing we have to do for the content provider. It's just going to open it up. And we saw it just opens up the content provider, so, which is what we're trying to do here. So Anyway, if I flip it back over here, I can see, oh, I've got an interesting looking. I'll put this underneath it. There we go. Interesting looking interface. Yes, not quite as beautiful as the iPhone, if you're familiar with the iOS. <laughs> this is kind of stripped down. Another big, my biggest complaint about it is that GUI controls just aren't there. So. All right, so moving right along. You have something open, open. On click. Yes, I have, I need to add something to the button, and it's going to be the on click here. Um, and thank you. Um, I was getting there actually. I was reviewing the code here, making <coughs> sure. Um, we're going to add an on click message that's going to be sent when we click it. And the on click is going to be called inside of the code. Um, so we need to add this property. Don't need to put the uh, layout alignment on here at all. But what we're, we're going to do is going to add it to the bottom of the button. And it's going to be called do launch contact picker. Let's see if we have an on click already set on here. We don't. So I'm going to add it as the last. Well, you don't need to. I'm going to put it as second last entry so I don't have to move the bottom of it. Yes, I know. Don't. There's act. Okay, so there's no such thing as usually. <laughs> there's probably about 10 different ways of doing everything. And the purpose of this is kind of to show you a lot of different ways. So this particular example, as I'm reminded, is running, uh, an, uh, is setting a property called onClick. And it's taking the onClick property and putting a tag on it that says do launch contact picker, which is in the bottom of here. And we'll see that actually integrated into the method that we're going to write in a few minutes. But I did notice that on the bottom of the button. So it's between, it's in the button tag. It's the last entry. The last entry of the button tag. Well, in my particular case, I didn't close it. So I'm going to need to put this guy back in. Well, this guy back in should be at the bottom here. Button. Well, we didn't put button in. So let's just see if we compile correctly. If not, I have a syntax error I've introduced. No, nope, we're compiled correctly. So if it saves, it actually compiles it and write, writes it to the r.java file. So that's what I mean by compile. <clears throat> so if you add it to the bottom, this particular code example is using the full bottom button closing tag instead of the shortcut method. This is the shortcut method where we don't have the word button written down here. Depends on how you're closing your tag. I always avoid the problems by putting it anywhere but the end. <laughs> if the automated code put it in there for me, I just leave the end of it alone and I just put it up on top. The order that you're putting these properties in has no relevance. Doesn't matter. So, and these are properties, by the way, that are being set for the button. So, in uh, Android, excuse me, iPhone, these are what would be called the attribute inspector. And you're going through and you're setting the properties for the component. So if you're familiar with Android, or excuse me, iPhone, that's what they call it. Launching the content picker, contact picker. So now you need to write the code to handle the button push. So we're going to launch the contact picker. <laughs> if I can say that right. 
One of the most uh, used features, most powerful features, the intent can be used along with the start activity for result method to launch another Android application and retrieve the results. So in this case, we're going to use the intent to pick the contact from the data that's being provided by the contact provider. Content, contact, content provider. She sells. She she sells. She she sells. She shells on the seashore. Okay, now you know what my problem is here with this example. I can't say the word contact and content. <laughs> okay, all right. So uh, here's the implementation of the do launch contact picker. The onclick property of the button is set to load this method. So change the main activity of the Java to read as follows. Just remove all the code. No, 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 I'm not going to remove all the code. You may remove all of the code if you want. I'm not going to take that chance. Instead, I'm going to look at the code. We're going to create a private, no, it's a final count. Okay, we're going to create a contact picker result equals, we're going to set a result automatically, just in case we don't get one. I'm going to copy this one here. So I'm setting a variable. I'm in main activity that extends activity. I'm going to forget about the includes and I'm going to do it manually, the imports. I'm going to just click on the manually because I don't like to put extra stuff in there that's not really needed. I might paste this one in here though. Uh, so I'm going to go back to uh, and close and save my main activity file. Come back to the source code directory. Go into main activity. I believe I should be able to make this bigger, but uh, I'm going to assume the code is big enough for you to see. I'm going to add a uh, variable up here, and I'm going to paste it in from the code that I just copied up over there, and I'm going to get rid of this line return. A private static integer, it's an integer value, it's called contact picker result, so it's going to be the placeholder for the results that we're going to get out of it, and we're going to set it to 1001. So, 1001 contacts. So, it's actually an old American joke, actually. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to not be lazy. I'm going to cut and paste these imports and put them in here as well so I don't have to go through and keep changing stuff with all those error messages I'm going to get. So, I'm going to go ahead and set my imports to the things that I'm supposed to be needing for this. I'm actually going to just stick them underneath and then see what has been duplicated and get rid of the duplicates. What do I have? I already have OS bundle. Don't need that one. I already have app activity. Yeah. I already have the view. View, view. Don't need this one either. So. I could do it this way or I could wait until uh, I see the little red box and then put my high thing under it says import something. But I wanted to save, uh, save all the imports here. So. Plus I also now have the context contact provider contact contacts contract dot contacts this is on the seashore and I've got the one that says common data kinds dot email which is going to pull the email from the contacts contract so I got that down all right so I'm going back to the uh, tutorial here and I'm going to add this method here and the method I'm going to add is the one I set the unclick button to And I'm going to copy. And I'm going to go back to my um, Eclipse project. And I'm going to stick this as a separate method, not inside of any other method. For those people who are not familiar with Java, we're adding a method to this class. The class starts out with public class. It ends down here on the bottom. This is the end of the class. And inside of the class, we have two methods by default. One is the onCreate method that we're going to need. The other one is onCreate options menu. I haven't started using options menus yet, so I'm going to save that one. So I'm going to paste this method in here and see where I've gotten some error messages already. So that's what happens when I paste stuff in. There we go. Got rid of the error message. What is this method doing? This method is do launch contact picker from the view view. So it's using the view. It's going to launch it into the view. <coughs> Let me put a little return here. Creating a new intent. Intent is a contact picker intent, is what we're going to call it. And it's going to be equal to new intent. And this is going to be the intent action 
action pick contacts content URI. And you're going to know, how do I know how to do that? Well, unfortunately, what you do is you get one of those really big reference books and you go, what are all the built in content providers? And, or you go online and you Google and say, I want to pull a contact out. What, what, how do I make the intent? And you figure out, well, this is the key right here. This is the intent that we're using, the creating the intent with a new. And these are the two parameters that we're sending to the object constructor when we create this intent. And it's going to be action pick, which means go ahead and just load it up and let us pick it from the content provider. And then it's going to be the content of the contact. <laughs> so the contact's content, well, I said it right, is going to show up on the screen. And we're going to be able to pick it right there. We could take the content of the contacts from the content provider. Oh, I said that good too. And load it up into the app and put it into a list box and pick it from there if we wanted to. But in this particular case, we're just going to load the content provider and have it picked from there. Which means when I, I select that button, I'm getting the same screen as we saw earlier when I loaded up the content. Excuse me, I, now I missed it. When I loaded up the contacts, <laughs> we saw the. Uh, we saw that screen. It's the same screen I'm getting from my application. Start activity for result. The result is going to be the contact picker intent that we put here. Contact picker result is here. So whichever one I pick, the index of the, the integer value that represents the index of the item in the contact list is going to be sent to contact picker result, which is going to be received back in. That item is going to say, okay, from this item, <laughs> pull the email address out of it, is what we're going to do essentially with this item. Uh, but I don't believe the code is in here for that, but let's take a look. It is not. It doesn't, actually. That's probably why I have an error in this program. It's not changing. <laughs> so let me take that final out of there, actually. This was hard set, so let me take this out, actually. But you know what? We're not going to be able to tell if it gets changed or not. We're not going to modify it because the code pretty much stops at this point. All we do is we bring it back, but it's going to come back as 1001 and there's never an email address for it. I believe that I did this initially because some people that don't have emails, and are you use, if you're using the emulator and you run this, it's not going to come back with anything. It's going to air out on you, actually. So I believe I put that in to debug it so that you could still run it with an empty contacts list. If you have one of those fabulous Android emulators, <laughs> you can actually save data in that, actually. The, the built-in ones, you can actually load, but you have to load up the emulator load some contacts into the emulator before you run this. If you run this right now, it was setting it and not changing it. The final made it so that it was not, it's like a constant variable. It's not going to change the value of it, which means it always comes up with 101. Now this should actually come up with 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, depending upon the order of the integer of the contact that's selected. So now it should actually modify it before it wasn't even modifying it. So. Uh, so that's why it doesn't really matter. Everything I clicked on was coming back with that no email address for because I don't have a 101 entry in there, so 1001 entries. But I don't believe the rest of the code is in here anyway, so it's not really going to do anything. It's not actually going to work unless it's on the bottom. Yeah, handling results, it is on the bottom. So at this point, let's run it. Launch the application, you should see the contact list appear. And when you click on the button, the contact list is supposed to appear. And as somebody mentioned earlier, we have no on click listener. We have nothing that we're doing inside of this particular class. Instead, on the button, we preset the on click events from the property to bring up this method. So make sure you have the on click property set on the button. This is a way of doing it so that we have no listener. What do we want a listener for? Well, we could possibly have more than one button in the particular case. We don't, but we could have more than one button, and then we could listen for a button click. 
or we can set the on click for each one of the buttons and then set a method that goes for each one of the buttons. So the button actually has an event that's generated whether or not we listen for the event or whether we respond from a manual level it will work both ways. So right now if you run the application, let's see if it works actually. Yeah. It's a not the way that they teach you to do it. They want you to do on click listeners for events because then you have on swipe, on touch, on this. You have all these listeners instead of just a button click. You're only picking up the button click. You're not listening for anything else. So I, I have a tendency to agree with you. But then if um, you're trying to listen for multiple things, there's no listening. It's kind of static, actually. It's kind of, you know, whatever happens. So I'm just going to click this button here and see what happens, actually. And my contacts come up, just as you might imagine. <laughs> so, and if I press the escape, because I haven't gotten rid of, I didn't finish this activity, which I'm not going to want to finish. When I click on one of these contents here, nothing's going to happen. But because I've clicked it, it sent a response back. If I wanted to, I could put a label out here for troubleshooting and see, put in the label, set the text to the result value that I've got up here. So as we go through this code, we might go, well, what is this contact picker result? And then we put it in a label and it says, you picked item number zero. One, two, three. And then you can figure out which one it is. All right, thank you for catching this, actually, because uh, it's always going to come back with an error as we continue. All right, so some of these examples were kind of altered to make it work, given all these odd scenarios that people run into. <laughs> So, if you don't have any contacts, fix the final, put the final value on your contacts variable, and that will avoid some issues. Otherwise, you'll have to create some contacts for this rest of this application to actually work for you. Okay, so we have this screen as expected. The screen comes up, launcher looks like this, we can pick an application. Now we're going to try and handle the results. And this is going to be an on activity result. In our intent, way up here, we have an intent here, action picker, context, contact. We have an automatic ending of the activity or a result of the activity that's going to be set. So because we're setting contact picker result, and we're putting it in our contact picker result, which is really bad practice, integer value. <laughs> so we have an event that's going to be triggered automatically when some result actually occurs from the selection of one of these. So now we're ready to handle the results of the picker. So once the user taps on one of the contacts in the picker, focus will return to the calling activity, which it does for us automatically. So we know the result is actually working. So the content providers looking for the result coming back from the content. Oh, good. And so you can grab the result from the contact picker by implementing the on activity result. It's another built-in method that is part of the behavior of the intent, actually. So we run the intent on the result of the intent that comes back in. We're going to do something with that. We're going to take the name, the address. We can actually print it if we wanted to. You can easily modify this to put labels out, as I was mentioning before, just to print the results onto the screen, it might be a le good learning objective. You should be able to be able to set a label because Hello World has us create labels and set, get the text and set the text of a label. Um, so, so it's as easy as that. We haven't done anything with them yet. So we're going to implement the method that says upon the return, do something. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to add the method to the main activity.java file it's going to be a brand new method. It's going to be on create result. It's a pretty long method, so I'm going to go through it, then I'm going to cut and paste it, and then maybe reformat it. <laughs> because it's easier than typing this whole thing in. I'm not a good typist to begin with, but let's just see what the method's doing. So the method on the result is a 
taking on as a method parameter the re re result code that's coming back was going to be did it pass, did it fail, maybe we don't have a content provider, maybe it didn't work. The result code and then the intent data that's going to be passed. The intent data is going to be passed is actually already written to our variable that we defined in the beginning as an integer. And so we have the result code and it's going to be okay. <laughs> if it is okay and it didn't fail, if it failed we're going to go back down here and say uh, sorry no content provider or something like that at the end. No, else is going to log log a message with content picker warning activity result not okay. We have a problem. We don't have a content provider or something. So this is sort of checking the result. If it's okay then we're going to switch and then for those people who know C++ or C this is the same thing. It's just written in Java. It's a case switch statement. So we're going to switch result code. In this particular case it's going to be uh, an integer value. So it's going to come back and say case the contact picker result cursor cursor. Well, it's the cursor. Cursor is just like the cursor concept of a database. <laughs> when we go to a database using any kind of remote connection, actually uh, not even using a remote connection, we just go to a database and we run a query. We get what's called a cursor that comes back out of it. It's the temporary memory that holds our query results. Yeah, so we're going to take that query result. Well, it's a query result. It's nothing. It's not, in this case, it's not a query. In this case, it's the cursor that's holding the data that we got from the contact. Automatically held in a cursor for us. So we're going to create the cursor as a temporary kind of holding mechanism in this case. Cursor, cursor is equal to null. Initialize it. Email string is nothing because we don't want a, like a garbage email string coming out of it. We're just going to initialize it to something. And then we're going to do a try. We're going to take the URI result that's coming back, and the result that's coming back is going to be called result, excuse me. It's going to be the data.getData. The data is the intent data. <laughs> so from the intent, we waited for the result code. It was an intent. The purpose of capturing the result, the result comes back, and you know, we take the data that we have initialized in this intent that's coming back from an on activity result method that's going to be automatically generated from the life cycle of this intent. Create a temporary variable, call it result. The result is going to be equal to data.getData. You just got to get familiar with some of these data types. <laughs> URI is a data type, cursor is a data type, and they actually represent concepts in terms of um, components, features. They're different data types. So we're gonna log, we're gonna put a log message on there that says contact picker got a contact result. And this is this is where my cut and paste is gonna fail, I see it. Uh, plus the result to string. So it's gonna put basically if we look at the I'll turn the DDMS on and we'll take a look at the log when I run this next, and we'll see, because this method hasn't been implemented yet. Next time we run it, we'll see and look at the log and say, well, what contact did it get? This is an easier way than of putting labels on the UI. Remember I was saying, I put fill up the entire UI with some labels, you know, and put all the stuff to the labels. Or in this particular case, we're writing it to the log. So we know what contact we're getting back. And then we're going to get the contact ID from the URI. So we got the string ID is going to be result dot get last path segment, which is going to be the content ID that's going to come out of it. Then query for everything in the email. So we're going to cursor is going to be equal to get content resolver dot query. As I mentioned before, this is going to be the result set. The cursor is equivalent to a, an SQL result set. It's a key value kind of kind of format that comes out of that. So we're going to have the email address, email dot content URI, email contact ID plus equals new string, and then we're going to use ID that's going to come out of it. So take these method calls for granted right now. Otherwise, you're going to confuse yourself in terms of what's going on. But we're basically populating the cursor with a query of the content resolver. And for the guy in the back that says, is the content like a database? It is in this point, but we're not running an SQL query. We're running a content query on it that's specific for a key field. It's more of a dictionary than anything else. It's a key value kind of combination that comes out of it, but we're using it like a database. But it technically is not a database. It's not stored in the same kind of concept. We can't. We can create content just the same way too, 
but it's technically different from a table, although it's being used in a very similar fashion. For those people who are familiar with databases, you're going to see a lot of similarities with this. So we're running a query, <laughs> not an SQL query, but a query. Well, it doesn't look like SQL. So and the query is going to take parameters, email.contenturi, email, contact ID. So we're getting the contact ID, we're getting the email, and we're going to write it to this get just to the cursor from the get content resolver. We're going to have the email ID that's going to be equal to the get column index email data. That's coming from the data. We have a key value. Just remember, we just have a key value kind of association. For email, we're going to have whatever the customer put into the email address. So let's just get the first email that's in there. There might be multiple emails in there. There's an index values associated with it. It's a cursor.move to first. This is like cursor. If you're familiar with JDBC, actually, it's it's like cursor next, cursor next, cursor next, cursor move to first. It's actually kind of the same syntax. JDBC is also written in Java, also has a cursor, also uses the same concept, but it uses it to connect to databases. So there's a kind of a, an interesting similarity here. Email is equal to who the cursor dot gets string from the email index. The log, write a log statement here. It says got the email and here's the email. Else, uh, no results, <laughs> no email, and then. Um, I believe there's a toast message that comes up eventually at the end that with the results of what happened to begin with. And then so it failed to get the email. Finally at the end, if the cursor is not equal, it closed the cursor. So at the end of the, quick, uh, end of the case switch, we're going to close the cursor and then we're going to write out an edit text. Email entry is going to be equal to the edit text is going to be a temporary um, name that we're going to put, you know, in, the, in the, the text box in there. We're going to add it to a local variable called email entry that we put in there. And then the email entry that's in the box is going to be sent from the invite email. That's the e edit text one that we put on the UI. Set text to the email. So that's going to change to the email that we got from the contact that we selected. If email.length is equal to zero, then no email found for the contact. So this is what I was getting when we had hard set the contact value and it wasn't actually picking a content. Uh, wasn't actually picking a content from the from the content provider. And then the toast is just a the, the length, length long instead of short. It's going to be just basically putting it up longer so we can see that toast message. And toast messages we looked at yesterday. It's just little pop-up messages. Show. Otherwise, break else put a log in there, it says warning activity results, not okay. Yeah, we had something wrong with the return. Maybe we didn't have a contacts, I mean a content provider called contacts. Maybe we removed it from the phone or something. So, so you get the results from a, other than result okay if the user cancels the operation or if something else goes wrong. You could cancel it. Final parameter to the on activity result is an intent called data. So when we created that on activity with the intent was the data, the data contains the results from the data that we're looking for. Different intents will result with different types of results. Different intents have different results that come back from them. How do you know that? How are you going to know that? You're going to look it up. Probably you're going to get one of those books that looks it up. Uh, one option for inspecting results is to display everything found in the extras bundle, as I was mentioning before, or in the data from the URI. You can. Uh, we're not really interested in the extras bundle for this particular application because we're not only going to look at the email address and we don't want to necessarily contain all that information. So, If you read through step number four, understanding the results, querying the contacts database for email on the end here, viewing the query results, it's going through the code that we put in there, retrieving the email, updating the form, setting the entry to the form. This is basically a very, very, very longer explanation, and I don't want to repeat it because I just went through it kind of line by line. So this one, uh, in the PDF, we've actually, once we put this method in, the functionality is all there. If you want a deeper understanding at a slower pace of all of the pieces of this, go ahead and read through the rest of this. It's about three pages of explanation. That's more of a textbook kind of, and I'm not going to just read it to you. 
it kind of gave you the makeshift lay of the method. So we'll see what happens here. We're going to paste it, put it in, fix the formatting issues, see what happens. It may or may not work. I don't know, unless I've got some other syntax errors in here, but we'll see. I think the logically it should work, actually, but we'll see. Copy. If not, it'll be an interesting experiment to see what the log brings out. Um, I'm going to stick it over here, actually. I'm going to stick it on the top. Only one on create activity? Is what you're talking about? Uh, on oh, on activity result, only one of those as well. You can't have more than one if you don't. Uh, you, you have to break it out. I would break it out per activity. So, per activity, this particular activity is going to call the contact. And then I would make another activity that was going to call a different uh, content provider and then have a different on activity result. If you put more than one method in here with the same signature, you're going to have a problem. If you have more than one intent with different signatures, you can do it. It's the, it's the method signature that's the problem. Because you're really overwriting, you're, you're, you're overwriting a method of the on activity. So how are you going to overwrite it? So it's the same concept you get with other... Uh, with other method overriding or overloading, I should say. Yes. Okay. Automatically called by itself. We're not calling it. Okay. It's when the result comes back on the activity result. This method's going to go. Okay. It's the same as the uncreate activity. So when this call actually whatever we have selected, it will pass those attribute values to this pattern. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So that is what I'm looking for. That will yep. have the entire information mm -hmm. which we actually selected from the contact Correct. So when we have that, so I was assuming that the data itself has all the information what we need. Why do we need to create the cursor into that? We have to take the data. The data variable is coming back from the intent, and it's just like a query result. You can't just take the query result and just print it to the screen. We could just do that. Instead, we create a cursor so that we can identify the email portion of that result. It's bringing everything back. It's bringing, it's bringing the whole data, it's bringing the whole contact back for us. So we got the name, we got the all these different email addresses, everything that's in there. So we treat it like a cursor so we can use a key value on it and we go, we just want this one. We just want the contact for the first email. Or excuse me, we just want the email address for the first email. That's what we're doing here. So, like, it's, it's, it's a one uh, row of information which has several columns. Correct. Uh, and it is actually holding se uh, several pieces of information. Correct. And you want to pick the specific information, which is, which is uh, just a column value. Correct. So, how do we know that it's not column values? <laughs> That's what I was trying to say. You have to go online and really get this structure. Otherwise, and then it's going to change. With different, well, no, the contacts are pretty solid. Some of the other content providers have changed over different, different versions of Android. So you're not going to know what's in there by just knowing. You're not going to. You can print the cursor out. Actually, you can find it from the cursor. You can take the cursor, sort the cursor out, and see what's in the cursor, and then analyze the cursor and use that. Or you can assume by looking up the references of what's in the cursor. And knowing that we have this in here and we have that in there, and and then selecting what you want out of it instead of using the whole thing. Yeah, you you can make it so you could just print out the cursor information, so and then you're going to see the tags, the the key value combinations. But in fact, that might make a good um, that might make a good teaching uh, or reference tool, I should say for someone who is interested in just seeing uh, all the content. Provided. In fact, I believe that you can probably find examples like that on the internet because I'm sure it's been done many times. <laughs>
Uh, it's like one of the most um, mis mysterious parts of this is figuring out well what what is in the content provider. And so you have a, a tons of documentation that lists out everything for here, everything for there, and then plus what's available. And then what syntax do you use on the method call to go get it? And what, what are you getting back out of it? So every one of them is slightly different depending upon what you're getting, like your text. If you take, take a look at, like, um, well, contacts is widely used, but there's some other content providers on there. I can't really think of something right now but as an example, but um, it's all going to be dealt with differently. So once you deal with it one time and you figure out the main format of it, then you just kind of go for the same kind of template or the same pattern for the next time you do it. And my code is still out. Uh, I have to get rid of the formatting issues here. That could become very, very specific to the system. Uh, it could be. Yeah. In fact, this is working with, this changed significantly with the API 2 or something, or 5. I think 5, actually. So everything from 6 and above or 5 and above follows this format and everything prior to that is of a different different API. So that's one of the problems you get is a little bit of inconsistencies with uh, the different API versions. So what's wrong with this line of code here? Create instance string, create a... Oh, I think this is the problem here actually, it's word wrapping. I've got some interesting word wrapping that uh, happens here. Uh, let's see. Get rid of all my word wrapping issues. I'm sorry. Okay, so what was that combination again? <laughs> Control Shift F. <laughs> I'm not a big cut and pasters as you can see here. Let's see. Oops, it didn't work. Uh, let me use the menu item then. Uh, uh, you know what? I'm going to do this instead. I'm going to go back to my contact picker project, and I have given you that code as well. It's actually downloaded. I have to change the final result, actually. Uh, my contact picker here has everything typed in correctly. <laughs> so you can cut, if you want to use it, you can cut and paste it out of here. In fact, here, just make sure this works, actually. Copy, <coughs> and then I can go back down to contacts over here. Oops, it's already opened right here. Get rid of this one. If I wanted to use my own rather than having to use the solution, paste it. And lo and behold, I have much better luck. <laughs> so I highly recommend cutting it. Let me just save it actually and make sure that works. <coughs> yep, so I'm going to close this one back up. I, oh, no, we have a problem. Houston, uh, what is our problem? Oh the package in the beginning here. Get rid of that. <sighs> ah. Now I know why I said it. to one. I hard set the value to one actually up here. I believe I've got a logical error going on. Yeah, yeah. Let me see. Actually, let me try this out real quick here and see what's going on. Security. You should not have a security problem. Security is the last of your worries. That is something you have to set on the Android device. So your Android device, if you're getting a warning on the emulator, then you have to set the emulator settings to allow access to the contacts. It's not having anything to do with the application. It's the device itself that is, uh, that is having issues. So I'm going to actually put on the DDMS here and see what's going on with this application. 
The application is running on my emulator. Okay, still very good. I didn't put any log messages. I didn't put a tag on my log, which is kind of sloppy. I've got a fundamental issue. Uh, let's see, starting input on focus. Okay, your app is going to say invalid, and then don't worry about it. There's a fundamental logical issue with the formula, uh, and I need to rewrite this tutorial to get rid of that issue. Um, we're using a final value in a non final scenario. So on the case switch, we're having issues with that. Um, I could pull that out actually. Let me actually let me try to debug this real quick. Let's pull this out here and not write it out. Uh, let's see. No, that's not going to work. Uh, let's see. Got another idea. Yeah, let's remove the static in here too. If we make it final, it fixes the case issue, but it doesn't fix. No, it's not gonna. It's not going to. Um, let me think about this for a second here. Uh, problem is the case wants a fun, it wants a constant uh, value. Um, let's see. We'll put it up here, huh? No, no, no. The, the problem is not with the value that's ending up in this particular variable. It's the use of the variable in this context. Java is going to complain about it. It is. When we get the result set that comes back through the data, it's being added to that. It's, it's, it's being added. This value is being updated when we click on the contact with the contact ID value that's coming from the data of the content provider. My issue is that I'm trying to use it in both places. I should come up with a different way of doing it, different variable for the case, because this is going to require a final. This, this here is not going to work. Once uh, a constant expression, which we're not getting, I could do this. I could do. Uh, no, I need it. I need it defined before the method. So okay. There's a fundamental issue that I'll fix at the first break, but I don't want to fix right now because it's too time consuming. So change this back to final value. It's hard set for us. We need it to be a final value so we can use it as a constant expression with our case switch. Otherwise, we have to design something else than a case switch in order to do it down here. We could possibly take that value and add it to something else, actually, for that. Um, actually, let me try that real quick. Um, integer my value. to fix this when I can think clearly. Um, can't do it right now. Uh, so change the final value, change the constant picker value result, make it final. So it's not changing, makes it a constant value, makes it acceptable in the case switch scenario for our picker. The issue that you're going to have is it's actually not going to pick the content. It's going to actually not come back with anything. It's actually not going to work. But the purpose of this demonstration wasn't actually to, to build the email. And to, in fact, it's half done anyway because we don't have 
anything happening with it. It's just coming back in. We're not sending an email message or anything. So what's going to end up happening when you run it is that you're going to be able to load the content provider with the contacts, but when you click on one, it's going to come back, but it's going to say no email found for contacts. If you put the final back in, set it to anything. It doesn't have to be 1001. It could just be any value. And what, uh, what you can do, actually, I'll let you guys do it. You guys can fix it. It's the case switch has got the issue down here. So you have to switch the logic of the case switch so it uses a constant value that's not coming in like this. Um, and it's a Java thing, so just take it at that. And uh, it's a logical code itself will compile just fine, it'll run just fine, but you have to hard set the value, otherwise it's not gonna it's not going to take it for the way that this method is designed. The method design, however, can be tweaked, and I'll probably will tweak it at the break, and we'll see what happens with it. Um, so in your application, the most important thing to get out of this is that you are actually loading the contacts. If you're not loading the contacts, there's something wrong with your code. If you pick a contact and it comes back and it says, no email found for the contact, it's correct. <laughs> because we're hard setting the contact that's coming back, and it's not actually using it, because it won't change a final value. So we're not changing a final value, it's not being set. So none of the data is actually being assigned. But don't worry about it. I can come up with another example for you that actually does it, but that's not the learning objective here. The learning objective was to see how we make the intent and how we check the result that's coming back from the intent and how we're supposed to essentially use the content on the phone instead of having to reinvent the wheel. So we don't create our new contacts. We don't. You shouldn't have an application that has contacts in it. Instead, what you do is you make a connection through an intent to the content provider and you use that. Yes? Did you fix it? No. Problem. Uh, oh, 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 oh. What, what, are you, what are you recommending? What are you suggesting? Ah, I see what you're talking about. That might be a good solution, actually. Let me do it this way. Pick your results. Mm. I have to change this one to a final though. My value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but where are we using my value? We're not switching the value that's coming back. We're not, uh, mm. Mm. It's the same, it's the same as before. It's going to be hard set to one. We have to, ch we have to, we're trying to switch the value that's coming back from here. It's, it's being sent to the do launch contact picker. That's what I'm saying. We need to use different logic in here to get this to work correctly. It's the construct of this case switch and the way it's designed is what the problem is. It's not going to do anything, actually, because it's final. It's not going to change. It's not going to be updated. Let's leave this one for now.
because it's not productive for me to troubleshoot it right now because it's going to take me, I have to like, when I'm not standing full room full of people trying to teach a class, <laughs> I have to actually kind of like do it like, it'll take me five seconds to fix this thing if I can just concentrate on it. So <laughs> um, let's, uh, I think it's probably a good time for a break actually. So let's take a break and uh, just to reiterate the point if you're not paying attention, your contact will always come back if you set the final value, it's always going to come back with no email. And it's done that way because there's a bug in the code that needs to be fixed. So we will fix the problem later on, but don't worry about it. If you have the problem, if you have the project built to this particular point, you've accomplished the task, this works. You should be able to load up the content provider. You should be able to pick one, come back to it. We're just not applying that index <coughs> value of the one that we have selected from the result. We're not using a case on it. We're using a case on an artificial number, and the artificial number is going to come back with no email address because we don't actually have that one. But uh, actually, I have it set for one, right? And let me add an email address. Actually, let me set it for one. I'm sorry? I might actually have no email address in there. Let me just actually see real quick. Um, hold on one second. Let me add something to this. Let me fix my, I don't, may not even have an email address in there. Um, I should be able to hard set it to some value. Uh, let's take a look here. This is, this does merit something. Let's see. Uh, contacts, contacts. Here it is. Ah, oh, not this one. I'm sorry. The contact, contact. The contact provider is what I need here. Uh, I had it when I first brought the program up. Where is it? <laughs> it moved. <laughs> it was on the right hand side. Alright, uh, can we edit this guy? Let's see, maybe there's an edit. Let's edit, contact. I don't believe there is a telephone number anyway here. I mean, there is a, e no, there's no email address. Add. Uh. So let me change the next one too. I'm not quite sure if I can't remember if it starts with zero or one actually right now. Is it working now? From your phone, so you have to so turn I the permission on your phone. No, I changed the oh, good. But you shouldn't have to do that, actually. It should work automatically without changing any permission. <coughs> it depends on the settings of the phone as to uh, as to what we're looking at here. So let's uh, let's get actually. Let me go back to this one here. And I'm going to change contacts to uh, one. There we go. Let me just try this one out before I give up on it completely. Uh, if you're getting a security warning on the phone, it has nothing to do with the manifest file, actually. You can open it with the manifest, and the manifest will open it up for that app, but the rest of your apps are still not going to be able to contact that content provider. It's a security setting on the phone itself. If you've turned off the ability of apps to actually access the content, which you can do by default probably, then your app's not gonna is gonna bring up that warning and say, hey, I can't. Security violation. Yeah, I would just do this. No, no, okay. We're hosed. Bad example. So I'll fix it and give you the revised code at a later time. But uh, for right now, I think that this, we've exhausted the learning objective out of this. And uh, we can probably move on to something a little bit uh, different. In fact, uh, we're going to take a, a short break. I'll troubleshoot some problems. I'm not going to troubleshoot the problem right now of uh, not showing the contacts. But I will troubleshoot any other problems in bringing up the content provider, which is uh, the learning objective here. And uh, next, uh, we'll, so we'll take a, a few minutes and then we'll come back and we'll do another tutorial on a different subject. And in fact, I think strings would probably be a good place to start with next. So, Okay, who needs help? 